We are talking once again with Ari Cohn. He is president and founder of the post prison the post prison education program and the post prison education program is celebrating 16 years of service uh, this month so Ari take it away okay and up in the upper right hand corner is Emma Hogan who's here in our new office with me in the lower left hand corner McKenna Kearns who's here also in the new office today. So, um, yeah, it's been the 23rd of this month. It'll have been 16 years. We, um, it was in August I've, um, of 2005, I was invited or suggested I should go to this nonprofit event. It was a welcome home our uh, event uh, welcoming two women and three men back into the community from prison. And I went there and Kevin Allen was one of the men. Um, and it was kind of cool. Kevin was the first student graduate prisoner of ours that's been in the new office. He was here the other day. Um, and then and then Jenny has been here <laughs> within the last week and Jenny's son Joe was like two doors down right now because his power's out at his house and he needed internet so but August 23rd we sat down at the UW Faculty Club and decided to start the nonprofit but it's been a hellacious crazy 16 years that I never envisioned in my wildest dreams Speaking of which might be a good segue. So the other day when I met Emma found us on the internet, which seems to happen a lot. I mean, Google found us in 2010 on the internet. Doris Buffett found us in the Washington state penitentiary real time in Walla Walla. A lot of people find us on the internet and Emma found us and she and I began talking. She was finishing up her undergrad and her thesis paper uh, was about issues that are super important to us. And so we, everything that Emma said, I loved hearing everything. And so finally it was like, uh, you know, why don't you spend the summer working for us or working with us? And she was like, what will I do? And I'm like, anything you want to do. And I'm like, when you, when you, when you get here, you'll be in the mix and, and you'll figure it out. So I asked Emma the other day if, uh, if what she's encountered here this summer is anything like she uh, uh, um, imagined when she was back in the Adirondacks near Albany, New York, finishing college and planning to come to this crazy place to work with a bunch of crazy people doing an impossible mission and her her answer had like 16 exclamation points behind it. <laughs> and maybe, <laughs> maybe you could talk about what you've seen, Emma. And, and, and how, I think how the message that had 16 exclamation points was your message saying that I wasn't allowed to leave or something like that. <laughs> well, that's true. Too. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but no, it, it was. Um, Definitely, I think part of my answer was that, yeah, I did. I did expect something, something like what I do with the students that I work like one on one with has been like something that you described that I was really excited for, that I was like really um, excited to get involved, like on a personal level, like one on one um, to have those conversations and kind of problem solve. And that's been really rewarding, I think. Um, yeah, I, I mean, exceeded expectations of what I thought that was going to be like. Um, but I think definitely I couldn't have um, predicted, like, the opportunities that I would have, such as, like, writing um, with Hannah has been um, incredible. Um, and... And yeah, I, I think like, I think there, 
I was really excited to finally be like be able to devote my full time to this work, these these issues, this cause, because I hadn't had any time in my life that I'd been able to do that. You know, it had always been kind of a side. Um, you know, it was always it was always something that I was like very passionate about. And this year I was working on my thesis. So, you know, that was a big part of my schoolwork, but it was it was a class as, a, as opposed to like my whole schedule. And so I was really excited for this summer to be able to really devote my full time to this. And I think, yeah, just just the opportunities um, like to write emails to people in the DOC that like um, like I have I have a lot of like anger on behalf of these people that I'm working with. And um, I think up to this point, just all that anger at, you know, these issues and the people responsible for them, um, I didn't have an outlet that was um, doing anything productive, really. I mean, well, you know, writing writing my thesis was productive in its own way, but it, but it wasn't the kind of like personal um, confrontation that I would like, that I was kind of looking for that would really impact people on a on a personal level, and so to be able to like the one week with um, that the one student that I was working with that you know you um, raved about how mean I was and stuff, but no, like <laughs> like the the I was actually able to like put that anger somewhere productive and and you know say you're wrong and this is why and this is what you should do about it and have something come about now. He's um, taking the placement test to start yeah. the associate's degree program. So that's been, I think, yeah, far exceeded expectations to say the least. I want to, I want to come, I want to come back to the problems you've encountered with DOC or that you've dealt with with DOC. But first, I want to duck over to McKenna and, I, and like and sort of ask you the same questions. Like I, I remember distinctly, so like two years ago. Or a little bit more. McKenna was a graduating senior at Seattle Academy, and she came down yep. to our old office in Soto to meet me. And I remember white T-shirt, blue jeans, and U.S. kids. And I mean, I remember that day. And um, and I wonder what. And you've been here in the mix for two years since and or a little more actually or a lot more so like i mean it, and i wonder if what you've encountered was anything like you had in mind when you were at, at sas and and uh and and deciding to uh to to come work with us and like, and what stands out are like the last two years. Uh, uh, what what really stands out in terms of disappointments and exciting things and sadness and all of that. Yeah, I definitely could not have ant anticipated how much the program would play a part in my life over the time, and how much it would impact me, and I know I'll take with me for the rest of my life. And Emma asked me a similar question yesterday when we were having lunch. Um, and she was just like, it's crazy that you're leaving after this long. And I don't know, asking me a lot of things that I hadn't even yet reflected on. And yeah, I think it's gonna be wild to leave after so long because as I think all of you guys know, it's so easy to be so emotionally invested in this work so quickly because we're working so directly with people who really have to trust us with their livelihoods and that trust building just takes a lot and requires a lot of effort on both sides um and i think that's something that's really special to, to what we do and then especially getting to do that in such an impactful way has been really really wonderful um and then i'd say in terms of disappointments it's hard to narrow it down to just one but we have just seen so many successful individuals and then also so many people who seem to have I don't know fallen to a few different fates but I think that the ones that 
have been hardest for me are the few individuals who have been on staff who we've seen go down harder paths. And I think there's been two people who were working when I started um, who now aren't in contact with the program anymore. And then one person who was working more recently. And so I think uh, building the kind of connections that we do on staff as well. And so that's one of the things that I was going to mention as my highlight is this summer having so many new people around um, and having so many people with such skill sets especially so beneficial and I think the program's really growing ways that I could have anticipated just in the past few months because of how much talent we have on staff right now and how many great people are around and then also oh, because of that as capacity we have how many incredible students we've been able to take on and how inspired I've been by so many of the people who I've been working with recently and so many of the conversations that I have with them on a daily basis. And so that's definitely made this past summer a really special summer to kind of end on. And I uh, definitely starting as an intern and I remember most of what I was doing was just looking at uh, the recidivism rates and I was calculating what the recidivism rate of the program was and compared comparison to DOC, but I think for the majority of that time, I wasn't talking to many students. And so I was still pretty removed from a lot of what we did outside of just reading personal statements. And I remember that being the most impactful part of my time working initially was reading those really uh, open retellings of people's lives and uh, the vulnerability that they shared there. But there's definitely extra component that comes in once I was able to actually build personal relationships with people and even um, going to a prison for the first time and seeing what that experience actually might feel like. But that's a long way of saying that all of this has been a big surprise, but it's been so informative and so special in ways that I never would have expected. So as you go chase your law degree at Villanova starting in about a month, are you going to, is, is is what you've seen here the last two years going to have any influence on what kind of law you practice or train to practice? Yes, I, I would say most definitely. I think I have no sense of an idea of what. You know what? We I ought to get to focus Kenner, on. Kenner, why don't you grab that jetpack <laughs> from Joe and get it by your computer, mm. and then okay. and then he can still, yeah. Then so is my Wi-Fi bad, Mister? No, you, I just keep seeing the circle spinning, and I and I so like your picture distorts a little bit, but your voice is <laughs> fine, Mister McCormick. Mm-hmm. The first, do you remember the first time you went to prison with us? They all kind of blend together, but I generally have a fairly good memory of first time. Which and, one? Which prison? Oh man, I'm not sure to tell you the truth. Um, I don't think it was Eastern Washington. I think it was over on this side. I think it was, you know, on the out near the peninsula, but I can't remember for sure. Okay. You were there with us when, when Anna Marie Cassay went to prison with us, right? At, at the Twin Rivers unit up in Monroe? I think so. Okay. But again, Do you remember before you went into the prison with us the first time, did, was what you encountered what you expected to encounter? No, um, I wasn't really sure what to expect. I mean, you, you kind of gave an overview prior to it, but, um, no, it wasn't what I expected at all. It was, um, I was apprehensive about going into prison, even though I knew that I was going in as a civilian and would be let, let, uh, go at the end of the day. But there's always a little piece of you that, you know, is worried that something is going to go wrong while you're in there and that, 
I'm just a chip you'll be trading for future, you know, <laughs> um, you know, benefits there for some of your students. Um, it was, it blew me away the, the degree to which um, when you and the rest of the folks uh, that you invited along on these tours um, from the get go, when we were first arriving at the prison, the, um, the knowledge that you had going in, the rapport that you had with the people working at the prison, um, that impressed me right away. And then you're kind of going through these different security gates, which realizing that there are prisons that have uh, much more intensive security features. But I mean, every time you're going through one of these gates, you're kind of the, uh, the stress anticipation level, it goes up as, as an observer. Again, even though we, we know that we're a protected class there. Um, and then finally, getting to sit down as you do presentations before the prisoners um, and being able to watch that and and as an observer and both seeing um, <laughs> most prison education folks who are telling their stories in front of prisoners and uh, sharing their their uh, their stories and and watching that and and riding that emotional uh, roller coaster and at the same time um, being able to uh, look out on the crowd of of inmates there and watching them all just glued to what your folks are saying and seeing that there's like these real connections that are happening and and it was just amazing it was like here was this this group of people that were all trained to be fearful of and i found them to be like super respectful i felt super comfortable in front of them um I mean, the whole thing, it, it basically came down to like a religious experience, you know, where yeah. you're just like, you go in with these, these certain expectations and certain um, ideas, and then you just get to watch them be crushed before you're off it's in a good way. Um, it, it was incredibly moving and, and, and hearing and getting to hear the personal stories of the people that worked at um, post prison education program back when we, we did the visits stories that I had never, I had heard like bits and pieces of, but to hear them tell their story is amazingly powerful. It's again, you just can't help, but get, you know, swept up in it and have a much greater understanding of what just some of these people are dealing with. So you know, I uh, I was thinking about. I mean, we should cover we should cover the last sixteen years in some way, shape, or form this morning, since that's what we're talking about uh, the sixteenth anniversary. That's happening, I think. By the way, um, nine years after my intent in two thousand five, it was to like retire at 65 and be out of this, be gone and have somebody else take this over. Um, and I, but I, we should cover, we should try to cover what all we've seen the last 16 years. And, and to, for those who care, try to get some sense of, what the work's about, what we've encountered, what's been horrible. And I, I don't know. Um, I'm sure this isn't right, but, you know, I know the worst thing. There's a lot of best things, but the most horrific thing that, uh, stands out in my mind was like, you know, my, as many people know, my father took his life on Father's Day in 1975. So like suicide is like a big issue with me. And, um, and in this program, we've encountered a lot of that uh, or in this, I don't know, we're not in an industry or, or there's a lot of people actually that think we're in an industry that is an industrial complex and it is an industry. <laughs> Um, but I don't think of our nonprofit as we're like peripheral to that. But, I, you know, 
Mike, Mark Stern, who used to be assistant secretary of the, of the health division of the Department of Corrections, now is a research professor for the University of Washington, and he's done, he did morbidity studies in 2007. And then he and Ingrid Benswanger, and Ingrid is a, also like Mark, a medical doctor, and she's at the University of Colorado, redid their 2007 study in, in 2013 and corroborated, basically corroborated that everything was just as bad as they, that they had found it in the research to be in 2007. And I think that's the big, that is the big surprise with me. But when you find I, that it's not just people recidivating and going back to prison because of lack of support, it's uh, people are, are dying from overdose and, and they're dying from suicide in large numbers, more than 5,000 people nationally according to Mark and Ingrid's study, die from overdose and suicide within less than two years of their release from prison. More than 5,000 human beings who have brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, grandmothers, aunts, uncles, who love them. And uh, every year, and, no, and nobody seems, to, I mean, on a real gut, visceral level, nobody seems to give a goddamn. Really, I mean, and I could, I don't know. I don't want to get hung up on talking about why I, most people don't. I mean, I see so many people with, that have huge income and huge wealth and they, everything that comes out of their mouth is that they care. Uh, but their actions in most cases prove that they don't. But when, when death hits at your doorstep, um, that's really impactful. And I, I think in the most, um, impactful thing, negatively impactful thing, shocking, was Michelle Connolly used to work in applicant and student services until I fired her, one of my better moves. And we, we were arguing about budgets one night at 1030 and, and uh, on the phone. And... Um, we got a text message from Joe Jensen. Uh, and Joe, um, who Mike's been on our radio show with before, and you know her, uh, Joe's nephew, Joey Jensen, ha had been a student of ours and became a close friend and really part of the family. And... Um, in the text, and, and he was struggling uh, for a whole lot of reasons. And the text message that Joe sent to Michelle and I was was Joe was that she was at Harborview Medical Center with Joey, and he was in the last hours of life. I mean, the text message literally says he was in the last hours of life. And and I. Uh, we both immediately got off the phone and I called Joe and, and on her cell phone. And that morning at about 1115, uh, because of all the horrible pressures that he was facing in his life, he went to the train station and jumped. And that night at like four in the morning, they cut off all the tubes and he died. And uh, we had about 13 staff at the time. And uh, Doris Buffett, Warren's sister, was fully involved in our funding. And and Google was fully involved. And I had I had to I had to notify everybody by phone call and text in the middle of the night that Joey had died. Um, and then everybody in the office convened, everybody can board members, staff, social workers who were doing their practice. And we all, and, and somebody who specialized in trauma stewardship is a friend of mine, Rebecca Demerol. And her husband came in to professionally try to help us all deal with his death. And I've never forgotten that. Uh, and we've seen other deaths 
Um, uh, and that's so that's that's the thing that's most negative with me. I, th- I the the most positive thing, or the or, or the the positive thing that rem- that I remember most was you know way back a hundred years ago, um, some some media person was asking me what. Um, you know, like what my hopes and dreams were for the nonprofit. And, um, and I think, I think my comment was pretty much along the lines of, you know, I just wanted to see one former prisoner succeed at college and graduate and and walk, walk the graduation stage. And then, and then I was like, then, then God can shoot me dead with a lightning bolt and I won't give a damn. Uh, you know, and, and, and that person ended up being Becky Heffling. She's married now, but back then it was Hopwood. And and she was our first graduate, I think, in 2007. And I got to know her and her kids, and I know her and her husband now. And 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 we go through all the hell that, that she went through and then see her graduate with a nursing degree from Washington State University. And, and now... I haven't talked to her in a while, but her husband actually was posting on my Facebook the other day. But now I think she's still she's a registered nurse at Sacred Heart Hospital in Spokane, married with kids and lots of happiness. And um, and her graduating was just like the super coolest thing in the world to take somebody who had been sentenced to prison for seven years on a meth conviction. Uh, are separated from her kids, lost her marriage, lost her freedom, and and to work for her and help her put it all together again and see it come to fruition um, was just amazing. And you know, I mean, since then, I, I mean, COVID killed going to graduations. They all happen on Zoom, I guess. You know, uh, like. We've had an uh, we had an intern in here from Seattle Academy last. We had two interns, uh, Marley Dugan and Ari Rose Marquez, and and then Ari stayed on as paid staff throughout the summer and still is. He's out at Vashon, and I told him to stay off the radio show this morning because the internet's so bad out there and it and it's distracting. But. Um, um, You know, we so so we haven't we haven't been going to graduations except for like when Marley and um, and Ari graduated Seattle Academy at the end of last spring quarter, and that's like you sit at your computer and you attend by Zoom. It's not quite the same as going to um, a university like the Evergreen State College and seeing Keith Whiteman move away from 40 felony convictions and six imprisonments and, and, and graduate with this degree. And, and so, so I, I kind of got addicted to graduations. I mean, they're, they're, they're like, you know, the, the things in my life that are, you know, I think better than sex caviar and nasty spumati is, is, is going to prison and, and uh, going to graduations. I mean, th- those are the things that I love. And, uh, so, but but Becky's graduation from Washington State University was with a nursing degree was just phenomenal. So those were like those were like. There's no doubt Joey's death is the is is the trauma, the greatest trauma that uh, and that sticks with me. But the whole parade of graduation. So like. Emma, your turn. McKenna, your turn. Y'all take a number. Jump, jump in. Talk. McKenna. Emma. <laughs> oh, you guys. Um, well, I actually, I have a question for you, Emma. Um, I was hoping that you could speak to some of the writing that you did with Hannah, because you mentioned it when you were speaking earlier. But Right. <laughs> yeah. Um that is just I mean 
I mean, part of it is like what you were saying that um, just like working on a team, um, the how many of us, like seven of us that are kind of like the core group on the on the WebEx chats and the post prison office staff group chat or whatever, like just just that group of talented, like not just talented, but but um, just to be surrounded by people who like care about the same things that I care about and come at it, like you said, with like a different set of skills and a different background. Like Hannah also wrote, I think it was an undergraduate thesis, like related to uh, criminal justice issues, but it was totally different than mine. And so like, um, and yeah, just to, so like to come from, I'd never like done any of this work um, with other young people. And so the opportunity to kind of like work with Hannah and on those things and um, because she is just awesome. She's so, she's so talented. And like, and I think that like, to see our work come together and like be like see like my own contribution to it and also see that it turned out like you know so much better than I could have done than it could have been just on my own because it was two like minds who really cared about this like coming together that was like super fulfilling and just like um yeah and I think like other moments like that like not just the writing but I remember like I don't know what week that was that like um it was me and Ari the younger like I was I think I was still in that email exchange that was really angry with like all the people from the DOC but like um I said something and then Loretta Taylor like sent me an email like off to the side like just to me and she was like hey like I'd love to like talk to you a little bit more about this like maybe we can set up a call and it was after we did that radio show like blasting her and um we're really upset with her for other things and and just like and so like I was like sure and I was and um she I think was really um and this is a great follow-up to our last radio show where we like yeah. absolutely yeah. destroyed Loretta Taylor but um she I think really wanted to have a conversation like face to face um the covid version of a, a video face call and and um to really have a conversation and see where each other were coming from and i like sent a message to like the office staff like hey like does anyone else want to come to this and ari rose marquez was like sure and um so it was just like me ari the younger and Loretta T Taylor, who is like kind of this like, I mean, she's pretty, she's pretty powerful, even though, you know, sometimes we don't, we don't, she doesn't use her power how Just so everybody as much knows, as Loretta, she, Loretta, but, yeah, Loretta yeah. used to be Dean of Education at the Washington State Penitentiary and at Coyote Ridge Correction Center, and then she retired, and now she's in charge of programs at DLC headquarters. So she's she's middle management. She's not like an assistant secretary or right. she's a couple steps below, but she's in charge of programs for the DLC statewide. And and the thing I, I ought to pull up the email that Emma's talking about. And, and, and you know and you talk about I think we should talk about honesty and dishonesty of government. You know that that's like one of the that's one of over the last 16 years one of the most baffling things and infuriating things, and it's what set Emma off, as we discussed in the last last month's show, was like just the blatant dishonesty of government. And and Department of Corrections is damn sure government. It's just where they say one thing to the public, like their front facing persona, what they put out to the public, um, they say, but their actions just are completely different and the complete opposite. So like. You know, they do not just that, and also and also just the like the lack of effort, the lack of the lack of effort. Yeah, I would say, in addition yeah. to that. 
Yeah, so like now, um, I had a list of questions. I got to go. I actually wrote them down, and I'm going to find one. And to to finish that, to finish that story, it was it was pretty. It was pretty. You know, um, not as productive as we would have loved it to be, but but some things came out of that, and it was like an hour call of me, Ari the younger. Like two people, how old is Ari? Like 18? Like <laughs> Ari the younger, me, and we were just kind of, you know, we like we were going back and forth asking Loretta Taylor like really important questions and like giving her an opportunity to kind of explain herself and try to defend some of these things. And at the end of it, me and Ari kind of just like demanded to be put in contact with someone who was involved in that, uh, in the committee for the uh, renegotiating the new tablet contract. And that's how we um, were connected with Anna. Loretta ended up connecting us with Anna, who we've been working with since. So anyways, yes, to answer McKenna's question, speaking to uh, speaking to more like the opportunity to work with other talented young people who care about the same things. But yes, now we can now we can talk about um, the. In. Uh, uh insufficiency i don't even know what what word to describe um how angry i was and still am but at least they fixed it for one singular person that we were working with I so look look kind of i was there's got to be the question i wrote down this morning is like problem you believe cannot be overcome I mean, you, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing or assuming that you that there has to be in your mind a problem that the nonprofit and our students we face that won't ever be overcome, can't be overcome, that's critical. Uh, and if there is, what is it? I will say that I'm a strong believer in seeing nothing as like solid and I don't believe that there's a single thing that can't change, um, but I do definitely see uh, certain forces that our nonprofit can't necessarily take on without extra support. And I think that the biggest thing for me has been all of the policy that's decided by very few individuals that ends up disseminating across the whole system and affecting so many people on such a personal basis. Um, and so I think like in a wider scale, I was just struck by how removed a lot of the decision making is. And so I think if nothing else, I wish that we just had more power to be involved in that decision making or even more pressing. I wish that the people who these decisions were affecting had any uh, like way to actually advocate for themselves within the system because it's just not built to have channels for that or to have space for that. And if anything, it's uh, discouraged and punished in so many ways. Um, you know, I was, I, I was thinking, listening to you, like, and I was thinking like, who, who's the, who's the biggest culprit in the whole the whole in our galaxy? Who or what's the biggest culprit? And it's not the Department of Corrections. I think it's mainstream. I don't think. I think it's mainstream media. I mean, I think the Department of Corrections. <laughs> and I wrote to Cheryl Strange, uh, as Emma knows, about this the other day. I think it's just rotten. I mean, it's literally rotten to the core. But in that's because of people they employ. So there's some wonderful people. There's some really wonderful people that have worked for the Department of Corrections who have become friends of mine, people who I admire and like today, even though they're like years into it, retirement. But on, uh, but there are some. I think there's, there's, also that those reflections speak to, again, like distance from the decisions that people make and. A lot of the people who work in DOC are working directly with a lot of individuals. And like, I don't know if you, Emma and Ari would 
have the same reflections, but I think we've all encountered a lot of really wonderful people who care a lot about the work that they do and uh, do some things like outside of, you know, the power of the DOC. And I, I don't know, I think it's when there's even more distance and like, especially like politicians, I think is where I've reflected on it a lot. And just, yeah, people who, I don't know, when there's other incentive systems built in that I think people relate more closely to, it's easier to be influenced by those. You know, I when I think, when I mention that mainstream media, going back to Becky, our first graduate, um, I mean, two things come to mind. One is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which I pretty much despise. Um, And especially now that I know what kind of guy Bill Gates is, (laughs) but but, uh, which I shouldn't even be laughing at. But that's but but um, the other thing I think of is just the way media talks about prisoners and, and, and teaches voting public which has everything in the world to do with our funding what what funding we get what funding we don't get media teaches the public and the electorate uh they teach wrong information dishonest information about who who people are that are in our prisons and the whole you know i some some media thing a couple of years ago uh, I was asked some question that led me to talk about the fact that I think half truths are as, as blatantly dishonest as just straight up lies. You know, so like yes. when when mainstream media tells half the story or one third of the story or just a snippet of the story and they don't do the whole story, then that's harmful. And, and so like uh, it has lasting impact. And so like. I, I'll never forget, uh, we had a board member, uh, one of our original board 3,000 years ago, uh, Janet Naram, who ran the STAR project in Walla Walla and worked inside the Washington Stand- State Penitentiary. Janet was on our original board, and uh, and and uh, when Becky came out of prison, she went to work for the STAR project, and so she worked for Janet. And she wanted to return to nursing. So before she went to prison, she had been a nurse, and that had been her dream since age 12. And um, and there's a neat video, by the way. If, if y'all go to our Facebook page, River Sticks Foundation did a phenomenal job. The first video that was ever made about our work was done by River Sticks, and it featured Becky and her family. And I think it's on our Facebook page, and I'm pretty sure it's on our YouTube channel. But But she, Becky, wanted to become a nurse again. She believed she couldn't, and she was looking to build a new career. And so Janet introduced her to me, and and then they emailed in her application. And at some point, we had the personal statement to Becky's application up on our website. I don't know. We had it in a section called Why We Help, and I don't know if it's still there or not. But the, the, the whole story with Becky was that she was a law abiding and none of this hit me. None, none of this has ever been printed in, in the Walla Walla union bulletin or by mainstream me- media. So like she was uh, a mom, married wife, mother, uh, law abiding nurse, probably had never had a parking ticket in her life. And some piece of, sh- uh, can I, well, what some reprobate, which is putting it kindly, kidnapped her and took her to Tri-Cities and locked her in a house and repeatedly raped her repeatedly over the course of a week, uh, of a weekend. So like, and it, you know, in my, 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 I, I, I could visualize that. I think one of my problems with life is that I, 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 I empathize to, to great an extent. So like I, I, I can visualize when I tell, when I tell, tell that story, which, by the way, Gary Locke, when he left being governor and went to work at Davis Wright Tremaine, wrote a beautiful 13-page declaration of Becky's whole story. 
and and uh, but I mean, it's easy for me to, in my mind, be like in Becky's shoes, and every couple of hours you hear footsteps coming down the hallway again, and you know you're going to be raped again. You know what? You hear the footsteps again and again, and you know what's going to happen, and it happens repeatedly. And she was so traumatized by that kidnap and those rapes that she had to take a leave of absence from the hospital. And, and so then she was at home and I'm going to cut this short and not TMI, it, but she was at home trying to recover from the trauma and not so much the physical trauma, but the mental trauma of what had happened. And a friend of hers who was at the hospital came by her house and the way Gary Locke told the story in this uh, really powerful declaration that he wrote uh, for her. Uh, she was like downstairs in the basement, lights out, it, cowering sort of in the closet, in the dark, more or less in a fetal position. Just she wasn't functioning as a mom, as a wife, as a human being. She just wasn't functioning and certainly not as a nurse. And her friend introduced her to meth. And, and so she could be happy again. And um, and so so then she became addicted to meth and uh, a, 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 out as a result of the rape and the kidnap. And um, then when she you know, you can't function as a nurse um, if you're addicted and, to meth. And, and so she eventually lost her job. Then she didn't have income to pay for the meth that she was addicted to. And so she started manufacturing. And 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 then she was arrested for using and in, in manufacturing meth and and sentenced to prison. And um, uh, none of that background, what you know, what what the Walla Walla Union Bulletin or any mainstream media, Bleth and Bleth and Incorporated, Incorporated here in town, um, you, you know, would just talk about is that she a person like Becky was justifiably arrested, broke laws, dealt drugs. So she was arrested and lost her freedom. And that was the way it should be. But there'd be no background at all about the trauma. You know, like two doors down, Joe Wolf is working using our Internet this morning because power's out at his house. And as, as I think everybody on Earth from here to Egypt and Switzerland knows his mom is a student. Of, the, of our nonprofit, and we worked for her since 2010. And media, media until now would, uh, um, you know, not report. They're doing it now, uh, now that she's become famous. But you know, when when she was originally arrested, originally went to prison, you don't see any of the, you know, the fact that that she was a four year old child when the cops busted into her house and took her dad away for a life sentence. You don't see that her, her mom introduced her to drugs at six. You don't you're not media doesn't help you understand the impact on a young child's life of, of, of being introduced to to meth and crack and black tar heroin, which is the case with so many of our students. You don't get any you don't get any of of, of the real you don't get the whole story from mainstream media, you just get this law and order, Richard Nixon, tough on crime, insanity, and constant drumbeat that turns people into haters. And and so I think, I, you know, maybe more than anything, uh, even down to like Gates Foundation not funding our work, um, and actually by policy steadfastly refusing to fund our work, I think that all traces back to what media has taught people who work at Microsoft, who work at Gates Foundation, who who work everywhere or and pick up a newspaper. So I, I think that's if I had um, if I if I was if I was to uh, the problem, I think that can't be overcome is is what most people in society believe about prisoners and former prisoners, which is so far from the truth and the reality that it's outrageously outrageous. So I don't know. We got about 
eight minutes, I'm afraid. Um, hi. We should we should talk about. I mean, it should be exciting that this nonprofit exists 16 years down the road from August 23rd. And then we're still able to help people in meaningful ways uh, or work for people in meaningful ways. Um, I got a call this morning. Maddie uh, Gates has been working for a, damn near a year for a guy named Tim Dillon to get him out of prison, I think, of all, almost 20 year sentence and accepted into the University of Washington. And, and Amari, if you're listening, we got another one coming your way. And uh, um, and Tim released this summer. He's accepted into the University of Washington. He will be a student at the University of Washington in fall. And uh, he called me this morning. He's moved from Auburn to the U District, so he's out of his parents' home in Auburn, and he's and he's and he's got a job in the U district and he's, and he's making money and he's clean and sober and he's focused. And in my mind, he'll be the next Jenny Burton. He'll set the world on fire, you know? And, and so that's, there's a constant, there's a constant, that's a constant day in and day out thing here. It's like we're working for people like McKenna's done for the last couple of years. And, 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 um, and then, and then like Emma was on the phone, has been working with a guy named Billy Rutledge, who again is a 20 year guy and he's in work release here in town at Bishop Lewis. And, uh, I think he'll be at Bellevue college. And then, and then talking about Joe Wolf who's two doors over. He's four, four, you know, he spent nine years in prison over a, a violation, which is incredible to me, uh, outrageously wrong, incredible wrong that government should be embarrassed by. And, and, but he's 4 O student at Bellevue College. Um, and God knows he'll be like launching rocket ships or some crazy ass stuff in a little bit, but just, you know, so there's a constant, uh, flow of that every day all day long uh and that's that's what's um that's what's i think if if, if there's something positive it's is it that that even in our most dire moments which usually is funding related that's going on and and we can be hanging on by our bootstraps wondering where the next how we're going to pay the rent or how we're going to buy a computer for somebody or, or somebody's about to release. I mean, we've got a woman getting ready to release a pretty on the 11th and she needs $14,000 for university of Washington school of law. And she'll be in our office on the 11th or the 12th. And we need 14 grand to get her through the quarter over and above financial aid. That's what Dallas needs to go to return to law school. And so, but there's a constant, we've been constantly, even in our worst, weakest times, that's been happening here in the office. Yeah. And it's, uh, I mean, while we're here in this radio show, you know, Maddie, Ari, Adrian are making that kind of stuff happen. Um, and it's just constant, it's a constant drumbeat of positive action. And so if there's anything to be celebrated about the fact that we're 16 years old and we've been, it's that we've been doing this for 16 hellacious years. So, um, and I tend to agree with like, not to cut you off. I tend to agree with McKenna that like, I don't want to say that, um, that problem that, you know, that verges on unso unsolvable, all, co all compromise, that verges on unsolvable of how the public views um, formerly and currently incarcerated individuals. Um, I think, you know, also like the depth and, and kind of like 
just how how um, ingrained and, and big that problem is, is like what makes this work so important, like, and, and keeps this work so important. Like, I, I think, you know, if this was, if this was an easy problem or it was like, you know, then um, why would we even need this organization? You know what I mean? Like, I think, I think kind of the point is that this work is, is so um, challenging and so important and so, um, there's so much of it. Like there's so many people to help. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. on that note, I know we had a lot of conversations when things were stressful and we were making difficult decisions regarding funding and other things, just that like the reason why we were coming across these issues was because we're fulfilling such a need and there's such a deficit. And that's uh, not attributed to us. And uh, like, that's why we're coming across all of those. And obviously that's a hard reality to face when it at times feels like we're the only organization doing anything like this. Um, but it definitely helps remind us of, I think the importance of what we do on a daily basis. I do think, you know, I, I, that really brings up a story that always resonated with me. Was like, so one of the most wonderful people I've ever met during our 16 years is, is a woman named Jenna Melman, who, and Dolphy Jordan was a student of ours. He's a friend of mine. He's a former prisoner. Uh, and he and Jenna are married. And they met when Jenna was running African student services in the office. And Dolphy was a student fresh out of 21 years of prison. And, you know, funding became so difficult. And, 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 and you, know, you know, having the choice dumped on your shoulders of like whether somebody's going to be homeless that night or whether they're going to have a roof over their head, that all, you know, that's that's really killingly difficult. I can't. And, and, and it's worn out so many people that have worked here over the years. I mean, we've got a turnover rate that probably beats any corporation on the face of, of, of Earth, you know. And it's because it's just difficult to like have the pressure on on you like, yeah, I'll find housing and we'll scrape together five hundred and fifty dollars and a hundred and fifty dollar deposit or something for an Oxford house. Or if we don't, then then that person's homeless or they come out of prison with no clothes other than an outfit that they're wearing. Um, no food, no clothes, no nothing. But you either you know, meeting that need or not meeting that need. And, and, and so many times when we haven't been able to do it, which is the responsibility of funders, uh, it's just, it's horrifying. And, and, and it's, I don't know, it's debilitating. But anyway, one day, Jenna, well, I just had the highest regard for her. And I, I talk to her probably monthly and I call her for advice. And she, she's a D, she, she taught me about DBT. She had her master's degree from Columbia and and then moved from New York to be with us, and 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 she just had all of that she could take, and and she and one day uh, she said to me, um, she said, I, I I I don't I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, I don't want to write checks, is what she said. And so what she was saying was she wanted to do advocacy work where we're not responsible for direct service, like buying groceries and housing and clothes and tuition and books and all of that. She just wanted to work on educating the public. Where you don't where you don't have the 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 burden of some somebody's homeless or they're housed they're hungry or they're or they're fed um and um and so um you know i've lost i lost i i'm i've lost track of where i was going with that but it's uh i've totally lost my train of thought which is a shame because that was like important. Um, somebody bail me out, help. Well, I think that that's, that's one of circling back. I don't know. Like um, one of the things that really drew me um, to like this organization in particular to do this work was, was that um, like, I really did not want to be like, I knew that I wanted to work, on prison reform but not in like 
a totally disconnected way. Like, if that makes sense, like this is very um, close, as close as you can get to the issue. I mean, Adrian, Adrian, who's actually experienced this herself, our incredible coworker who um, is a graduate of the program and we just interviewed for um, our first episode of the podcast, said that um, when she works with students in student services, she feels like she's going through the process for herself yeah. again, which I thought was one of the most powerful things that I'd heard. And obviously, I've never been through the process myself, but like we are, this is as close as you get to, uh, you know, both being there um, for the successes and, and the, you know, and the risks and the suffering. And um, so I don't know if that's close to where you were going with it, but. Well, if it isn't where I was going, it's a good it's a good place to end up because. It, it, but you know, the fact is, it is that oh, I know exactly where I was going now. So like, um, so ten days after Jenna said that to me, she was gone. She went to work for Consejo. She's fluent in Spanish, and she went to a place where she didn't have to have the burden of decisions of whether somebody's hungry or unhoused or unclothed. Um riding on her shoulder and um and that impacted me hugely and i started thinking mike you're gonna have a heck, heck of a time editing this because we're at 104 27 right now uh but uh i i, I started what i started looking back at a whole series of people that we've worked for and i and i was i was like i want I, there's some of the people i knew if we hadn't been involved in their life they wouldn't have made it so make it is you don't die from overdose, you don't die from suicide, you don't return to prison, you re, you you build a life that's worth living, right? That's that's my version of make it. Maybe you even do the impossible and attain happiness. But like, I I went through this whole inventory of people like, so like Dolphy Jordan, Jenna's husband. I know darn well he would have made it on his own without us. He wouldn't have met Jenna. <laughs> but, which would have been sad because they've got great kids and a beautiful home and a great marriage. But, but he would have made it. He, he could have made it without us. And then, the, but there's some, some other people that uh, I knew could not have made it without us. Just absolutely would not have. And 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 it, it, without us being in in, the, in their lives. And then there were some people I didn't know. I wasn't sure if they in their mind would have made it or not. So I wrote Chris Jones an email. I actually wrote 10 or 12 people an email, but, but Chris's response um, was, was uh, I'm going to try and find it in Outlook real quick, and then we'll close out. And then, Mike, you can spend the afternoon editing this. Good luck with that. But, but Chris's response was uh, really impactful for me. Uh, I want to try and find it if, if I can, but it was it was just like he would not, not have made it, uh, if it, but for us and um, and he stated it really eloquently. I've almost found it, so bear with me a minute. Uh, I, he ended up uh, uh, on our board of directors. Why has Outlook got to be slow when I need it to be fast? Will somebody please call Bill, Bill and Melinda Gates and tell them to give Microsoft some more money so they can be better, better company and deliver better products. Um, um, I'm, it was, just, it, it, it was, it was, his response, I thought I had flagged this in my archives, but his response, since I can't find it uh, right here where I want it, was was pretty simple. It was like he would not have made it. And there's never been any doubt in his mind, never been any doubt in his mind. Here it is. Here's, this is what he said. So this was November 14, 2011. Um Chris responded. He says, "I have an exam." He was he was uh, at WSU at the time, or he might have been at Penn State working on his electrical engineering. But he says, "I have an exam coming up soon, so I will be brief." I think it is very unlikely that I would have made it 
in the absence of financial support. Financial support was not something I would have received from family or associates either. It simply was not there. When you paid my rent soon after I was released from prison and put down a security deposit for the Oxford House, those were pivotal times. In my life, great intentions have been turned into great despair with mind-numbing speed. I was used to losing. At any point, I may have been close to giving up and admonishing myself to never give in to flights of fancy, like having a life worth living. Maybe I'm lucky compared to you in this respect. <laughs> I have never once had to wonder about the impact you made in my life. Never once. Thank you. I got to run to class. And that's probably as good a time now to end this month's radio show as any. I'll forward that email to everybody. All right. Thanks, everyone, and happy 16th.